everyone. I'm Adrian. I'm the founder of The Proof. I'm here with Steph. Hey, guys. I'm the founder of Levitate Foundry. Nice to see you all today. Um, and extremely hyped to have my friend uh, Sandra Roker on today, the CEO and founder at Sanzo. So to kick things off, Sandra, if you just want to give us a quick rundown. First, of just your background. Um, and then second, early days of Sanzo, how you got it off the ground. And then we can go from there. Yeah, sure. So first off, thanks so much for having me. It's so cool to be on with like friends, um, you know, more than anything. So yeah, uh, I'm Sandro, the founder and CEO of Sanzo. We're the first Asian inspired sparkling water using real fruit plus no added sugar. Um, had the idea back in 2018, essentially Crazy Rich Asians was like the number one film at the box office. I was working at a, a technology startup that had um, lots of sparkling water in it, um, but all of basically at the same lemon, lime, grapefruit flavors. And just, you know, I mean, it, I'm kind of like oversimplifying it, but essentially there's a, a lot, like a, a really big, I think one of the biggest things that I noticed was just there, like 2018, and I don't think it took like a rocket scientist to figure it out, but um, was kind of like a big year for what I call like a bridging of East and West, you know, in New York city, you're already seeing a lot of, um, you know, like the restaurant scene was really becoming much more, uh, Eastern inspired. You're already seeing in, in fashion, um, film, TV, uh, anything that you could stream. Um, there was definitely like, like a bridging of cultures there and ultimately felt like there wasn't really anything in beverage that was like kind of capturing, um, that zeitgeist. And, you know, I, I, like a big thing that I was kind of toggling with was, is this like a fad or a trend? And I think if you look at, you know, immigration patterns, um, just kind of like, if you kind of like study cultural history, um, there's just many, there's just many reasons to, to feel confident that this was you know, like a really like generational trend um, that had been happening. And uh, yeah, I mean, it essentially it took like a year of, uh, R&D to like kind of learn the industry, learn how to even manufacture a beverage, sell it, like how you even do all that. Um, and we eventually launched in, you know, midsummer 2019. Um, sorry, I live in New York City. So if you hear any sirens, that's uh, that. Um, but yeah, we launched in, uh, in July 2019, have been in market for about 18 months. And uh, yeah, that's, that's us in a nutshell. Brilliant. I love it. Um, it's also really funny. I'm flashing back right now to us. I think we were grabbing drinks at the Ace in like Nomad or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember you were showing me the initial specs of, I think it was glass bottles at the time. Um, so purely from like a development perspective, um, like what was the, I would say if you could distill like a couple key learnings or if you were offering advice to like a young beverage founder, um, what were the key learnings specifically around like manufacturing there? Because I know this was like completely new industry to you. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the, I mean, just from a purely operational standpoint, um, the easiest and cheapest way to get any kind of V1 out there is through a glass bottle. Um, so if you're in any, any kind of beverage and you're really trying to bootstrap or self-finance, um, you know, to give some actual numbers, you know, there was a manufacturer that I was talking to and their minimum run for bottles was like 500 bottles per per flavor not not a lot um when you're talking about canning you're more in the realm of ten thousand um cans per per flavor and a lot of that just has to deal with the equipment that's used um to you know, to manufacture these products and so um you know it really i'd say depends on how you're going about it i mean if you have a lot of capital you're and you're you're you're, you're able to kind of get out of the gate running you know you can you can do that um i decided to you know self-finance it um and so it took like a very very iterative approach um to to getting the product out there but um I, that, that is probably one big thing that i'd say hangs up most entrepreneurs i mean forget f and b but i think in general is like shipping product you know for us actually physically shipping product um but for whether you know whether your product is digital or physical um just kind of getting it out there and getting initial feedback i think do i i will say i think a lot of folks do make the mistake of just letting things fester in their head um for too long and i do think you need to have you know a bias towards action um it's a it's one of the hardest things to launch a business you don't need your mental psyche talking you out of it, you know, getting initial wins, getting the product out there, um, getting folks talking about it, like 
that kind of like, like that kind of momentum you just need, I think, to get over that, um, that, that, that for those first earliest humps. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of that, I know you guys just recently relaunched your website. Um, and with that, a, a cool new sort of Disney partnership. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? Of course. Yeah. Um, well, we worked with this agency. You may have heard of it. It's called Levitate Foundry, founded by Steph. Um, and, you know, they, uh, you know, it was, you know, we were going through a, a period of time for a variety of reasons that we felt like it was necessary to upgrade our website experience. Um, I had launched the first one, you know, the, 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 the website before this on just literally a free generally basic product photography. Um, and that had gotten us to a certain point, but honestly, one of the biggest things that it didn't allow us to do was really tell our story and just kind of showcase for customers who we really were about. And in the beginning days, I'll admit, like I didn't know fully what we were about. I had an idea, but a lot of it was just trying to get product out there. Um, fortunately, over the over the course of the, of the last eighteen months, you know, we've really developed a lot more about what our you know what our brand voice is, you know, what we stand for, uh, who we want to serve, um, and it kind of came time to it became a bit of a cry, I think a bit of like a, like a, like a black eye on, on the brand that we didn't have a website that, um, you know, more, more accurately reflected the progress that we made. And so that's when we reached out to Steph and, um, you know, very fortunately she, she just, she got us. And probably one of the biggest things I'd say, you know, I guess like another learning is it, like brand agency fit is like a pretty big thing to screen for. Um, I think if, especially you're in the consumer goods world and you're trying to tell a specific story. Um, so whether it's the creative director or, you know, whatever the title is of the, you know, of the agency of the person who's heading up an agency, um, you know, finding people who just get what you're building, whatever that is, uh, really, really helps with whatever scope of work you end up uh, defining. So, you know, it was, in particular, you know, we were, as uh, Steph knows, um, obviously far too well, we were on an incredibly compressed timeline. Um, my, definitely my fault on that one. Um, and uh, the biggest reason was, well, there are several reasons. Again, a lot of reasons why I screwed up that part. But one of the big reasons was we had a Disney partnership launching um, on March 1st. Um, essentially, uh, you know, the, the Disney team, ta uh, the, you know, they're releasing this film uh, today, you know, today's March 5th when we're recording this interview, um, called uh, Raya and the Last Dragon, featuring for the first time ever um, a Southeast Asian protagonist. Um, and Disney really wanted to find, you know, brand partnerships that were much more authentic to the, the, the story that they were telling. Um, you know, we don't know exactly all the nuances that went on in Disney headquarters, but, you know, we do believe that over the last year, you know, there have been a lot of serious conversations with large corporations, you know, from the Disney's to other big CPG, other big media brands around really increasing representation and being more thoughtful um, around bringing on, um, you know, like founders of color and, 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 and brand owners of color. And so um, it's kind of crazy to say, but they reached out to us. Um, and obviously we were going to oblige on that opportunity. And yeah, I mean, Steph's work, you can see it now at drinksanzo.com. Um, we think is just such a great manifestation of, um, you know, of the brand that we are and even more so in what we aspire to be in the years and decades. I got, I got to sneak peek see it like it's kind of interesting they give you these um behind the scenes like little codes and you have to do, you do have to sign these waivers that say that you're never you're not going to tell anyone about the film so i can't say anything about it but um it's definitely worth um yeah definitely worth the price of admission <laughs> I love it. I, to your point earlier about finding a good fit between the agency partner and the brand and the founders, all, everyone is a team. And I think the difference with us is like, I get involved in founders I love and you're obviously one of them. And this was probably one of the easiest projects I've worked on in two years because we just jived, we just got it. And that is so, you know, synergy is really hard to find. Even with the yeah. timeline i mean we were working nights and weekends even then you, are, you, are, you, are you holding to that <laughs> no i remember texting you saturday morning i was actually in austin i was like we're deploying the site and you're like yeah ray is launching 
soon. So that, yeah, <laughs> we just, we got it. It was, it was like working with, with your buddies, you know, so it wasn't like work at all. That's when, you know, it, you know, it's really meant to be. So definitely a fun project and thank you for the opportunity. Um, that actually leads me to our next question. So, you know, what is next for Sanzo? You guys have obviously done extremely well over the last couple of years. Um, and, and moving forward in terms of like raising venture from a high level, you know, how did you approach it before? How do you want to approach it moving forward? Um, what are you kind of thinking in terms of um, growing the company? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, our very our first round that we raised last July was um, so we raised a so after so yeah I, I bootstrapped the business until about July 2020. Um, Adrian was heavily involved uh, in our fundraising in, in our fundraising process, and to be honest with you, you know, we so w in the press is you know we raised 1.3 million dollars on like a convertible note round. Um, 90 plus percent of that money was from angels, family offices, folks who are you know who don't have. Um, you know, exactly that VC math um, that we need to, uh, you know, measure up to. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, pretty intentional. Uh, you know, the beverage industry, you know, is a bit different from a lot of other, um, you know, consumer goods or consumer tech even, or especially. Um, and so it does require a certain level of patience. And the reason for that is even for as well as, uh, you know, a food and beverage CPG brand can do on direct consumer. And we've been fortunate that, you know, during the pandemic, we've done, you know, we've done quite well. We also know sparkling water in general, um, you know, did quite well um, during the pandemic. Um, ultimately, what success looks like um, over the long haul is in retail. So in grocery stores, um, in, you know, bodegas, convenience stores, um, you know, a big, a big thing for us is, you know, food service. So, you know, restaurants, quick service restaurants, you know, places of that ilk and that just takes a little bit more time um, um you know a good example is you know whole foods where um in order to get on a whole food shelf you know for a beverage like ours you know there are two times in a year where they review what they want to put on the shelf and so what it could just be unfortunate timing like just when you started the business but if you missed that window you're now having to wait a minimum of like six months before you can, you know, get in front of them. Um, and so fortunately we had an investor, we have an investor set um, that is incredibly, um, you know, empathetic to, you know, to our journey and what that takes. Um, and, and, and as we really look to the future, you know, it, it's, it's folks who, even if they have that, you know, that, the, that venture model, um, you know, understand what it takes to win. Um, and I, 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 I will say that, I mean, just even today, had a conversation with, you know, a pretty top tier, um, you know, New York based venture capital fund. And I try to lay it all out there. Like, these are the reasons you should invest, but also these are the reasons that you shouldn't invest. And I'm giving you already the reasons for if you want to neg us, like why you would, um, just so that we know that if you're going to come into this, this is the game. Um, and so what's, you know, what, what's in stake for our future? You know, the biggest thing that I have thought about is that, I believe our brand is currently a little bit ahead of our distribution. Um, it's actually a good thing. Um, you actually, you generally want that. The distribution part is actually an, an easier thing to fix than if you don't have a brand that hits. Um, but, you know, we do want, uh, you know, we are very focused right now on increasing distribution. So, you know, what we've, what we've disclosed publicly um, is, you know, we're working with two of the top tier um, local distributors in, um, in the north, in the northeast, and in Southern California, respectively, um, we'll have more to announce. Just can't do, you know, just can't announce it right now. But uh, it really, increasing our distribution is um, kind of a key thing because we are seeing, specifically in Whole Foods, in Erewhon, in places that we were selling in, we are selling very well. And so, you know, we we just want to replicate that. Yeah, um, I'm I'm curious specifically as you expand distribution um, and you're talking to more investors. For both, um, as you're expanding the team and bringing new investors, uh, the personality traits that you look for, I don't think we've actually talked about this, like in terms of distinct values, whether it's you know, their direct personality, like what specific components are you optimizing for of just the people you want around you, whether it's on your cap table or like the person next to you at the warehouse? Sure. I mean, first things first, like especially for early stage, but probably going to be true through, um, you know, growth stage and, and whatnot, is just like, does the investor get it? Um, how much time do I have to spend explaining, you know, why this is a thing? And obviously, you know, 
we're, you know, it, it's on me as the founder to, you know, to have, you know, certain facts and figures and trends at the ready. Um, but the very first thing is screening for what into the, tr you know, in, into the trend, you know, fortunately, and, and I know it's a bit cliche, this idea of, oh, there's just a whole bunch of money, you know, sloshing around. And I, mean, I know for a, a super early stage founder, you know, I would put myself at least a year ago in that camp, you know, if you're having trouble, like that's a tough thing to hear. Um, but to a certain degree, you know, it is true. Um, and uh, I think if you go in knowing that an easy corollary after that is the idea that, well, there is like those investor sets should be pretty um, diverse, if not their actual like physical features, at least in their, their investment theses. And so, you know, we fortunately found uh, at least step one was folks whom within five minutes of, you know, obviously you give the, you know, the introductory pitch. It's, it's less about, do they get the, the brand vision and like what we're going for and more of, okay, can I get behind this from an investment standpoint? So if we're getting into more of like that, then I feel like, okay, as long as they get me, get it, we're at least operating from a common ground here. And, and again, they could eat and we have people who get us and still don't invest and that's totally fine. Um, but that's at least, that at least feels like a much more um, positive conversation. And, and like, I can easily sense um, and we'll cut it off uh, and have cut it off at like, you know, 10, 15 minutes if I don't feel like they get it. Um, so that's, that, that's number one. After that, it's like, you know, we're fortunate now, especially that um, most of our investor intros are coming from warm leads. Um, folks like Adrian, <laughs> um, who happen to have extensive networks, but also, you know, other folks now, you know, we have some pretty prominent angels. Um, and so, you know, we do, we, we do screen for a certain level of integrity um founder empathetic you know i don't i don't want to use the term like founder friendly because because i think you've had some that it sometimes lends to some you know improper behaviors but at least like can empathize with the founder's journey um those are probably the biggest things that we you know that we that we screen for and then ultimately it's what do they add um sometimes and look like so I think it's a common uh, Twitter length thing to just say, you know, every, every investor should add something so dynamic and unique. And look, especially at the earliest stages, sometimes you just need money. And as long as someone's willing to give you a check and kind of get out of your way, sometimes, sometimes that is good enough. Obviously, you know, if you're able to screen and be even more selective or especially over time as the brand develops and you start gaining some notoriety, you could start screening, you know, a little bit more. Um, but just even knowing what you want out of that person's check. So it, it, it cuts both ways. I think it's important for both the founder and the investor um, to know why they're getting involved. Uh, but so, yeah, I don't know that answers your question, but those are some of the key, you know, some of the key points. That does. Yeah, absolutely. I think the way you look at that, the way you just, an angel investor myself. It's really interesting. Um, so, you know, next question is really around innovation. Um, obviously, I'm Asian as well. And I was really taken away with your vision because when I look at sort of the Asian brands out there, there really aren't that many. So are you looking to innovate the whole category or are you just, is, is it going to be always sparkling water? Kind of like, what are you thinking in terms of Asian food beverage in general? Yeah. I mean, that's funny. I feel like this is a, this, this is literally question I get from investors. So if anyone's listening and wondering what conversations go like, this is, this is one of the questions we get. So um, my take is like in, in beverage in general, we just look at brands, the best ones stay in their lane for at least a while. And it happens that they either build a category or the category is so big enough that they're able to create, you know, a, 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 a substantive enough business. Um, why I have such conviction around what Sanzo is, is if you look at the top 10 beverage, uh, sparkling water brands in just the United States alone, they are all nine figure, um, and beyond brands, like literally a hundred, 200 plus million dollar, you know, brands just in the United, in, in really just in, in the United States. And during, uh, you know, 2020, um, with COVID, like the category itself expanded by over 30%. So you're literally having a hundred and two hundred million dollar brands expanding by you know a pretty sizable amount so my take is right now you know we're not we're obviously not there yet um and so it really behooves us to stay focused on what we're doing because we really see if we're able to just you know keep a, a tight focus on who we are and what we are um we think there's just such an opportunity there to create an amazing brand that said 
brands also, once they achieve that level of, once they, once they earn, I think that's the biggest thing is that we feel like you have to earn the ability to jump out of your category. And certainly we have aspirations um, of doing so, but um, you know, we really want to earn that right. And we do feel like, Hey, if we if, like just killing it and sparking water right now up to those figures um, is that, 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 that's how we, that's how we earn the right to expand to other categories. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So I guess we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing to reveal. Uh, nothing to reveal right right now. I have it on a deck, but I'll keep that one close <laughs> to the chest right now. I love it, Adrian. Yeah, um, I mean, just wrapping up. Um, we don't have too much more time. So specifically, curious about like two months into the year, what were a couple of big wins thus far, um, and then you know moving into the next ten months, where do you want to be by you know end of twenty one going into twenty two. What is Sanzo? How big are you? Sure. I mean, on the marketing side, you kind of touched on the Disney partnership. That's obviously, um, you know, for a brand of up until Monday, uh, three employees um, was a pretty big, you know, win for us. Et cetera. Um, that is now a pretty big, uh, you know, talking point that we get to, that we get to have. Um, Distribution gains. So yeah, we, you know, we are really starting to beef up our distribution in, in the Northeast part of the country as well as Southern California. Um, and yeah, we built, we just brought on two new team members um, on Monday uh, and are hiring for a few more. So uh, it's really been, and, and honestly, the, like the unsexy part, I mean, on the operation side, um, we're starting to scale, you know, over the last few months, we've hit some interesting, like, scale points that have actually started opening up some more gross margin. So that, you know, that allows us to um, more, a bit more healthily um, fund the business, uh, fund marketing programs that are crucial to um, succeeding in retail. Um, and so I don't know if there's any one particular thing that I can speak to that um, will be like the aha, like will have crushed it in 2021. It's kind of the combination of all of that, uh, you know, really yeah sales distribution marketing um the team we we do we do need to grow the team um that's probably one of the key lessons that i'm learning as a founder is um you know it's fun in the early days to to kind of have the solopreneur badge um but you kind of have to quickly lay your ego down um food and beverage brands it it takes a village and so um i'm very quickly learning right now how to transition from being a founder and into being a CEO. And that's probably one of the things I'm most excited about um, having the opportunity to now do with a little bit more, you know, resources behind us um, and a little bit more, um, you know, traction, um, you know, under our belt. I love it. I love it. It's a perfect place to wrap up. Um, everyone check out Sanzo. It's drinksanzo.com, right? That's right. Sanzo.com. Better go and buy some sparkling water. All right. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Awesome. I'll see you guys soon. Cool. Bye.